Marketing is a podcast for business owners and leaders produced by my dad, Steve Davis, and his colleague at Talked About Marketing, David Olney, in which they explore marketing through the lens of their own four Ps, person, principles, problems, and perspicacity. Yes, you heard that correctly. Apart from their love of words, they really love helping people. So they hope this podcast will become a trusted companion on your journey in business. David, if I were to say to you that instead of watching television of an evening, I had decided to walk through the little creeks near our house and capture frogs of different species and and pin them to a pin board so that I might study the differences between them, would I be using my time wisely? Right up to the point where you pin them to the board, I think you're exceptionally good time usage. But now I'd put you into um, shock therapy. Okay. Uh, That's a foretaste for where we're going in the first segment of this episode. Welcome to episode two of series three of Talking About Marketing. We're going to make a, a stop there. At the pursuit at no of people, frog damage. With no frog damage. We're looking at an amazing uh, book, a bit of thought uh, process called One Mission, which, David, you're going to take us through, and we're going to continue our journey into the realm of sales, plus the reverse, teach you how to stop people taking money from your accounts that maybe one day you thought was a good idea, but since then, it's just been ticking away in the background. Our four P's. Number one, person. The aim of life is self-development. To realise one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. Oscar Wilde. For the person segment this episode, I think this book that I've read has much to inspire us as we think about... Oh, I've got to find time to blog. I've got to find time to do something a little bit different to shake up what I'm doing in my life and my business. The book is called A Short History of Nearly Everything. It's by the American-British writer, Bill Bryson. And it really is a romp through the history of this planet in a pretty well put together hopscotch, if you like. Have you read this book, David? I haven't read this one, but I've listened to some of his other books and they are always really entertaining. Yeah, so basically he traipses his way through history, but not necessarily in a completely linear fashion. He's he's divided into themes, but there is one theme that as it came up again and again and again in this book, I thought I need to share it with you here on Talking About Marketing because we do ask you, And we ask ourselves to do a lot that is in the realm of creativity on behalf of our enterprise, of finding some extra time to invest, to make things different, to deepen our sense of connection to what it is we do and the people we service. And what this book makes very clear is just about every leap forward in human history especially uh, whether it's um, new institutions or new practices, new insights, has all come about because someone somewhere had an idea and they were willing to follow their passion, sometimes obsessively, until they had that aha moment and made a discovery and saw old things in a new way that jettisoned the world forward. Let's have a listen to an example of this. In the late summer or early autumn of 1859, Whitwell Elwin, editor of the respected British journal The Quarterly Review, was sent an advance copy of a new book by the naturalist Charles Darwin. Elwin read the book with interest and agreed that it had merit but feared that the subject matter was too narrow to attract a wide audience. He urged Darwin to write a book about pigeons instead. Everyone is interested in pigeons, he observed helpfully. Elwin's sage advice was ignored, 
and On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life was published in late November 1859, priced at 15 shillings. The first edition of 1,250 copies sold out on the first day. It has never been out of print and scarcely out of controversy in all the time since. Not bad going for a man whose principal other interest was earthworms, and who, but for a single impetuous decision to sail around the world, would very probably have passed his life as an anonymous country parson known for, well, for an interest in earthworms. So that's one example, David, but there are many examples, and perhaps really my favourite example is talking about Charles Darwin and... Uh, <laughs> That book he wrote on the origin of species, which, of course, changed the world greatly in our understanding of how we've evolved, on the origin of species by means of natural selection, it was called. I love this. Did you know he actually got advice when he put his manuscript forward from uh, Whitwell Elwin, who was editor of the respected British journal, The Quarterly Review? So he'd read this advanced copy by Charles Darwin, and he agreed the book had merit, but feared the subject matter was too narrow to attract a wide audience, and he urged Darwin to write a book about pigeons instead. Everyone is interested in pigeons, he observed helpfully. What would have been the world what would the world have been like if Darwin had taken his advice? Well, I guess if Darwin had taken his advice, we maybe would have I think the guy's name was Wallace's book That's right. about evolution instead. So I think the ideas were brewing, but boy, would we have got a different story. And there's something about the Galapagos and finches and tortoises that's kind of far more exciting than pigeons. Well, it is. But the interesting thing that uh, Bill Bryson charts nicely is – I mean, Darwin was quite gifted in his observational skills, the way he could look at things, draw, make connections, etc. But he he did it with some degree of passion, not as obsessively as you might think. It was a uh, hmm, something he enjoyed doing. But then he'd get on with life and he'd do other things as well. The the thing that I want to impress today is that if we really want to make a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs used to say, it really is up to us to shun the things that sap our time and energy, which could be Netflix. It could be, I'm shocked at myself at how much time disappears down the drain of social media apps because you don't intend it to be the case, but you just get sucked into this vortex. And I really feel like the world is becoming a little impoverished as far as breakthroughs are concerned, whether it's at the micro level of what our entity, our business can do, or the macro level of how we can impact others, because of these secret little pleasure trips that we can all have that don't challenge us, that just let us sit in a cocoon. Do you agree or am I being too harsh, David? No, I think what you're really summing up is a movement from people's minds, even if they got on with the day they had to get on with, there was something in the back of their head that said, oh, I got to work this out or I got to investigate this further. There was a, you know, a can-do attitude and an activeness in about developing and growing ideas it was more normal because people had more quiet time. There wasn't bright screens flashing and, and going, look, 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 this is exciting. And you know, humans aren't good with distractions. If you put bright things in front of us, we look at them rather than thinking about things that take a long time and take a lot of effort. Yeah, I think the, res the residue of my thinking from this book, in a strange way, if we focus on our focus here, which is those of us listening who are leading or running or owning a, a business or an entity and having a focus on marketing, is what Timbo Reid says from the Small Business Big Marketing podcast often. I really like this phrase. I wish I'd said it, but he did. He said, well, he said, in our roles, if we can embrace our marketing activity as a hobby, we will yield a great dividend. It's when we go, oh, I've got to do this and I'm so busy and I can't make time for it. It's just a curse. 
we're never really going to have the great outcomes that we can if we have a more playful approach to this because this is, I think, in harmony with these great thinkers who discovered accidentally many things that have helped make uh, humankind what it is today and it is that it's colouring outside the lines. We're not staying stuck in the role we have. What do you think, Damon? I think the words that were popped into my head as you were talking about that is really so much of Bryson's book comes down to the fact that there were people who were inquisitive and enthusiastic. And even if the thing may not have been exciting to other people, because they were inquisitive and enthusiastic, they just kept pushing through and finding amazing things or having a dead end for a while. But either way, it didn't break their inquisitiveness and their enthusiasm. And even though in small and medium enterprise, we've all got the things we're inquisitive about or enthusiastic about, more broadly, you wouldn't get into taking control of your own destiny unless at your core is a decent-sized dose of inquisitiveness and enthusiasm. So try and bring it to each thing you need to do, even if they're the apparently boring things. Because if you do it with a bit more inquisitiveness and enthusiasm, you'll probably get a better outcome for the same amount of time and effort. Yeah, and I think of it every morning when I slip my Udi on uh, and think how effective they are at immediately creating a bit of warmth on a chilly morning, whereas we've had dressing gowns for eons, but it just took someone to bring these pieces together and it's made my life a little better. I burn a lot less fossil fuel. These are the, the fruits of that curiosity. Our four Ps. Number two, principles. You can never be overdressed or overeducated. Oscar Wilde. David Olney, your mission, should you accept it, is to talk about Chris Fussell. I can do that. This and it's interesting how these two sections have linked because you know, everything we were just saying about Bill Bryson's book about people having the inquisitiveness and the enthusiasm to just push on to want to work things out and take the time to do it. Chris Fussell was the poor person who had to clean up the chaos caused by a deep thinker with a can-do attitude. Okay. Explain. So, I will. So Chris Fussell was the aide-de-camp to Stan McChrystal, who was the American general in charge of special forces in Iraq between 2004 and 2009. And every time Stan McChrystal, who was a constant reader and thinker, would come up with another idea on how they could try and improve the situation in Baghdad, how they could capture more terrorists, how they could stop more bombings. He would have the brilliant idea and then move on to the next meeting and poor Chris as his aide-de-camp would be sitting there going, uh, what do I do to make <laughs> that actually happen? Because I'm not the boss I'm several ranks lower, I don't have the resources, and I just didn't think up that idea. And he got really good at turning Stan McChrystal's ideas in counterterrorism into, how do I implement this? So when Stan McChrystal retired from the military and created the McChrystal Group and started going out to the corporate world in America and going, look, people, I worked in a very different world. I worked in the world of counterterrorism. And me and my people pretty much rewrote the book on counterterrorism in five years. And we learned to do fast change and we learned to do high stress change and we learned to assess things honestly. And now that I'm out of the military and I get bored easily, I want to help you improve your world too. Because clearly after the global financial crisis, you're all not doing so good in big business. And the same thing happened all over again. Stan would go and meet with these amazing companies and go, you could fix it by doing this. And they'd go, that sounds amazing. Get all excited, hire McChrystal Group. And then, you know, when Chris retired and joined McChrystal Group, he ended up with exactly the same role. And that is the <laughs> company that realized there was a way to fix something, would have the meeting with Stan, get super excited and go to the meeting with Chris and go, Chris, Stan says we can do this and this and this and this, and it'll be awesome. And Chris is like, yeah, it will be once a worker how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so poor Chris went from being aide de camp in a high-stress situation to being a senior person at McChrystal Group in a high-stress situation. And wow. Stan said, well, you need to write the how-to book. 
He says, I write the crazy idea books. You write the how-to book. And one mission, which is Chris Fussell's big book with a couple of co-authors, is all about you want to grow and transform your business. And it's a combination of everything. You know, he and the McChrystal team learnt when they had their military careers, and it's everything they learnt in their first few years of helping the corporate world in America and then gradually all around the world. And he worked out that the how-to comes down to two critical things, which are as important in small business as they are in huge enterprise, as they were in counterterrorism. And he gave them really simple little titles to remember. One is strategic alignment, and the other thing is empowered action. And what he meant by strategic alignment is, if you're in charge, you've got to come up with the strategy And even if that means listening to everybody and taking everyone's input, you have to articulate it in a way where it's cohesive. And then you need to make sure that all your people understand how what they do contributes to the strategy. So everyone has strategic alignment. They can see the big picture. They understand how their small picture part contributes so they can get on with their job knowing that they're part of something bigger and that they're appreciated as being part of something bigger. So the opposite there is where you see someone working on something and they just, oh, why the heck have I have to do this? Yep. It's the antidote. Yep. It's, it's the antithesis. It's, I know why I'm doing this. And even if it's a bit annoying, I know it needs to be done because it contributes to this and it makes it possible for everyone else to get their job done. So even if it's not the best bit of my work week, I know why I'm doing it. Yep. Okay. That's the first one. So that's strategic alignment. Alignment. And the other phrase he came up with to keep in your head is empowered action. And he said, happy people are empowered people, people who know they're trusted and respected to do their job. They know where their job fits in the big picture and they have the skills and the resources they need to do it so they can act with empowered action. They have what they need to just get on with it and to thrive individually and therefore help the organization or enterprise thrive. So what that means for senior people in an organization or founders is you need to be focused on once the strategy is in place, not just explaining it to your people, but going, now what do they need to do their part well? What skills do they need? What resources do they need? How do we make sure that they feel confident in their competence so I can trust them to do it and they can trust themselves to feel they can do a good job and not need more than minimal supervision? Because the more people have empowered action, the more they take responsibility, the higher productivity becomes and the better feedback they can provide on how what they do contributes to the overall strategy. So Chris Fussell said, if you can keep these two things in mind and keep them balanced, that you've set up a strategy, you've achieved strategic alignment, and you've thought about how you need to empower your people so they can take action to do their job well, that through strategic alignment and empowered action, you can grow and transform an organization because your people always feel confident in their competence and confident in what they're a part of and confident that they understand the overall strategy of where we're going and why we're going there. It's been a a two-year process since Team of Teams to put one mission together. And for me, it's definitely taken the argument to the next level to say there are actual processes, leadership behaviors, ways to create this sort of decentralized model, much of which we've sort of learned throughout the last 10 years. Um, But the effort to capture it, I hope, will really resonate with audiences because, I mean, you remember us better than any of us, when we first started having these conversations outside of the service, outside of the military, it was new thinking in many ways. People sort of didn't, didn't get it, didn't get the application to the broader world. It was considered really a a military issue or a counterterrorism sort of issue. What's happened in the world of the last, you know, two years in industry and global change and politics has really driven the conversation home that everyone agrees now that this is happening. Team of Teams sets a great foundation as to why 
it's unfolding. And our hope is that with, with one mission, people can then get the next layer of the argument, which is here are things you can start to implement inside your organization if you actually want to transition through this, uh, this process like we, we did in the military. So let's just go back. We've got the crazy ideas man, and then Chris Fussell comes in and says, all right, how do we align this How thing? do we actually do it? Yeah, how do yep. we do it and align it so everyone knows that they're aiming, what the end goal is they're aiming for, and if their action is empowered, if they they feel engaged and they're part of it, they're going to be happy along the way. There's still got to be an aspect where in some cases it can be a bit daunting that we're doing something completely new uh, that can shatter people's confidence. And there's a, in the sidecar, riding along with those ideas is that notion which came up in our conversation the other day that you never start from zero. How does that complement what we've just been talking about? Yeah. And this is something, you know, I often used to teach people in conjunction with Chris Fussell's work because all Good ideas link to other good ideas. And there's a wonderful organizational psychologist called Catherine Kramer that really helps us keep this in context and apply people like Chris Fussell. And she went and looked at what in organizations, which teams do the best job, which get the best outcome, which teams are happiest. And she found there were some things some teams did that got higher performance. And then she trained some teams to combine these three things. And, well, it's really three and a bit because her first thing was she would say to the team she trained, you never start from zero. You've always got your previous experience, your previous successes, and your existing skills on your side. So you are never starting from zero. You're always reapplying your successes and your skills. And that alone, she found, had a really positive impact at helping people deal with change. The next thing she realized was really powerful was to get people to go, okay, what new thing are you working on? Well, this thing. All right. Is it similar to something you've done before? Now, if a team could find that what they were about to work on was something similar to something they'd done before, they felt more confident and more competent and did a better job. Now, any of you listeners out there have done sort of complex problem training with Steve and I, you know this is a thing called reference class forecasting. Mm -hmm. And that is you go and look for projects like the one you're about to do. And if you can find a project that's similar, that's great. But you also need to capture, well, what are we going to do that's different and new? Because it's important to recognize we are doing new things and prepare for them. And this leads us into Catherine Kramer's next step was to go, okay, if your project isn't entirely similar to something you've done before, what skills do you already have that are going to enable you to do this new thing? So once again, you've already got something in your pocket that's going to help you succeed. And she found that teams who could articulate, well, even though this thing we're doing is new, we've got these skills between us as a team and we can apply them. This is going to help us be successful that teams who did a, a skills audit like this were more successful, which then rolled into the third thing she found. And that is that when a team come up with a great plan to move forward, that acknowledges their previous successes, acknowledges their skills, and they go and explain this process to someone they trust, a person like Stan McChrystal or Chris Fussell, someone with tons of experience under high pressure, who when they give you a nod and go, yeah, that's a really good plan. That combination of comparing the new project to things we've succeeded at before, of doing a skills audit and realizing we have the skills to move forward and describing the plan to someone highly capable who will either give us constructive criticism and feedback or the nod and go, that sounds good. I reckon you're going to be fine. And if you're not fine, I trust you're going to be able to solve it. What Catherine Kramer found was performance of teams who did these steps went up on average by 70%. Gee, that's which is a staggering huge. number. Yes, absolutely. it is. It's why she walked out of basically conventional practice and now just bounces around the corporate world training people to do these steps because it puts people in so much better a place to get on with doing 
the things they need to do to grow and transform their organizations. Hmm. So, you know, Chris Fussell really came up with the practical how-to guide, and each of his chapters in One Mission tells you how to do it a different step in a practical way. And Catherine Kramer came up with a psychology that can reinforce this kind of growth and transformation. And if you put the two together, which you know I've helped a lot of people do, suddenly growth and transformation stop being terrifying and stop breaking people. And instead, people want to get on board, they want to succeed, and you know, positive growth becomes the most likely outcome. Hmm. What interesting content. I hope this segment has helped you start with a little leg up, not from zero. Our four Ps. Number three, problems. I ask the question for the best reason possible. Simple curiosity. Oscar Wilde. Looking into the inbox today, where we deal with any problems people have had, and this time it was me. I got an email a few weeks ago from Rank Math, which is a, an SEO plugin, saying your Rank Math business subscription will be automatically processed on a certain date. And I went, oh my goodness, I didn't know that I'd taken up the pro subscription. I thought I only had the free subscription. It was going to be a few hundred dollars that I wasn't necessarily deriving much value from. And unfortunately, I saw this note after the date because emails like these, the great Google in the sky, shunts out of the main inbox and puts them into an update inbox. Very handy, easy to overlook. And so I hopped into PayPal and was able to find that indeed, not only was it had it just renewed, it had been renewing for the previous two years without me being consciously aware of the fact. So I cancelled the subscription and then I emailed Rank Maths and said, look, I missed the the um, the notification. I don't want this service. Can you refund it? Had a little bit of argy-bargy, but eventually they said, okay, that's fine. Because you know, who wants a customer who's being held against their will? So there's some lessons that came out of this for me and for everyone. The first one is... If you do have a PayPal account, I strongly recommend having whatever credit card you use for business connected to it so that whenever you do take up a subscription for things and it gives PayPal the option to pay for it, just do it that way because it doesn't add any cost to you. But the PayPal system is very good from a consumer-centric side for being able to say, um, pay no more, thank you. And the other thing is, Keep your eyes open for emails that talk about subscriptions renewing. Now, you may not see them. So maybe a few times a year, not a bad idea. If you've been doing this and using PayPal as the payment source for these subscriptions, just to tuck your head inside PayPal occasionally and look at your subscriptions list and make sure that Everything you're paying for is what you remember that you want to be paying for and not something that gets by quietly in the shadows, ticking away without anything you've used. I found something else lurking there that I had no longer any need for. So it was actually quite a fruitful mission to cancel a couple of those things. So there you are. Nothing wrong with uh, subscriptions and memberships. It's quite handy to have things tick away without having to be actively involved. We are now offering that for people for our website care packages as well. A client asked me about that and we made that happen. And that's all wonderful. But being on top of it, so if your needs change, your payment regime changes too, is pretty wise. Our four Ps. Number four, perspicacity. The one duty we owe to history is to rewrite it. Oscar Wilde. We all live in the Sandler submarine. The Sandler submarine. You're not singing along, David. No, I thought you were just having so much fun. <laughs> and having just listened to the submarine book by the former head of Australian Submarine Service, I'm like, no, we're meant to be silent and deep, man. What are you doing singing? They're going to find us. <laughs> well, I want to be found because in perspicacity, 
right throughout season three, we're diving into, so to speak, the depths of David Sandler's book, You Can't Teach a Kid to Ride a Bike at a Seminar. And uh, we mentioned there are seven parts to his Sandler submarine, which is how he's broken down the sales process. So let's look at the first one, this episode, which is all about bonding and rapport. So bring your chair a little closer because this is the first part to having more success in sales and sales conversions. So how would you paint Sandler's understanding of bonding and rapport, David? What I like about Sandler's approach to it is he started working in his family business where it was relatively simple sales and there wasn't much pressure. You know, his family had clients that had for years, and it was literally just a case of dropping in and finding out what the current order was, finding out how they were, how business was. It was a very relaxed thing, and it made him just easy with people. He didn't want to pressure them. They didn't think they were going to be pressured. So you know, when he had to go out on his own path once the family business was gone, which is a big part of the early part of the book, and start selling to people, and he was told from the first minute you're meant to be applying pressure, it just didn't fit with him. And he needed to go back to what he felt more comfortable with, which was actually just connecting with people and making sure they knew that he was a reasonable person and he'd worked out they were a reasonable person because that way you've got a foundation that's leaning towards kindness and the beginning of trust, and that is a much better place to be. Yeah, he makes references to the fact that your traditional salesperson would come in in their shiny suit and walk into the person, that the, the owner or the manager's office, look around and go, hey, lovely family, looking at the family portraits, or there might be a, a fish on the wall. Hey, you love fishing. Simply said, Rapport is sharing a common point of view. By mastering rapport skills, you will bond more quickly with your prospects and influence them to become your customers and clients. When you walk into a prospect's office, what do you do now to establish rapport? Traditionally, salespeople look for something in the office that raises a question. For example, is that your sailfish on the wall? How many times do you think that prospect has been asked that question? How often do you think the prospect hears a salesperson? Ask about the family portrait on the wall, the golf clubs in the corner, or the collection of clowns on the bookshelf. I won't disagree that these questions help to establish rapport, but the prospect anticipates them. They're amateurish and outdated. He's really quite down on that. He's saying, first of all, it's fairly meaningless. And secondly, that person has heard salespeople say that every single time. Mm. They've agreed to you turning up because there's something your company's got that might be really helpful for them. So how about start the conversation with things that are relevant? You know, tell me more about what your company does. Ask them what they'd like to know about your company. Make it relevant, but also not directly about you know, what problem have they got they want to solve and what product are you going to try and sell them? General information to show that we could have a, a decent conversation in a kind and respectful way is going to put us in a, a better place to be able to speak with, you know, truth and confidence hmm. as the conversation goes on. And, and interesting that point about asking them questions because he does say that, that that's a much better use of the time. I yeah. was I was at a an agricultural event recently with Alex Thomas, one of our uh, clients. She was on a panel on women in agriculture. And one of the other panellists, who was an agronomist, who has to go out to farms to do all the soil testing, etc., in what is, at the moment, a steeply male-oriented field. And she could see a farmer's eyes when, they, when she hops out of her big four-wheel drive and sees that it's a woman and a rather small woman at that, uh, with fairly modern-looking hairstyle, etc. she could see them go, oh, and oh, is she going to know what she's talking about? And it's quite a barrier to mm. building rapport. And she said, you know what has worked for her? 
just ask questions about their farm, about their plans. And she said, without fail, it completely broke the ice and it built the rapport that got her the trust and respect that allowed her to go on. So it's interesting, isn't it, to see David Sandler writing this in his golf club or country club in America many, many years ago still has relevance right in the outbacks of Australia today. What do we do about this, David? How do we apply this as the first step of our Sandler sales submarine sonar? Well, I, I think that's the key thing. You just summed it up really well with the example of the agronomist. Now, that's a fairly specialised area where an agronomist is going to know when they go out to a farm, well, what kind of you know, geography has it got? They might know stuff about the next door farm, what kind of soil, what kind of rainfall, all these things. So a little bit of research so you can start a meaningful conversation with someone about you know what their company does, where they want to go, you know what's their dream, where do they want to get to in three years' time with the business. And all that can start gently leading into the real issue, why your product might be relevant and what problem they have. But if you start with their problems, you're making them feel vulnerable. If you let them talk about what they've achieved and their dreams, they can talk about their successes and then they can talk about what successes they want to have next. A bit like what we were just talking about with Catherine Kramer. You're focusing on previous success and skills and making sure that we start by talking about positives that can make us both feel good about you know, engaging in a conversation that eventually is going to end up having to be about what problem have they got, what product do we want to sell them, how much money do they have, and what it's going to cost them. We're going to have to get to some fairly difficult conversation at some point. So let's start with stuff yeah. that builds up sense of success, sense of self, You know, makes the dream clear, makes goals clear makes our enthusiasm for the industry we're in clear, our enthusiasm for helping people succeed clear. That's a good way to build you know, rapport with a new person. Yeah, because most of us do like talking about ourselves and our plans because we don't often get asked because so many of us walk around with the big mirror in front of us, aka social media, let alone a physical mirror. And so that's a breath of fresh air as well. Plus, you never know, there'll be nuggets out of that conversation that will help you understand whether or not the product or service you have to sell is relevant to the, the needs that that client's facing. Perhaps the only thing I would say is both you and I are reading through the wonderful recent biography of Oscar Wilde, and he did impress someone in his younger years in the art of conversation, instead of just being facile, he, this person remembered him asking, so do you also think much in the world today is hollow? Now, that's a great conversation starter, mm. but, but not one for bonding and rapport, I would no, think. No, not one unless you know, your product somehow fits in that direction generally. <laughs> yes. you know, like maybe if someone builds rainwater tanks, it's kind of a gag and you could go with it, but I think you might get a look like, uh <laughs> On that note, uh, may your experimentation with bonding and rapport lead to great conversation and not uh, best avoided. Thank you for listening to Talking About Marketing. If you enjoyed it, please leave a rating or a review in your favourite podcast app. And if you found it helpful, please share it with others. Steve and David always welcome your comments and questions so send them to podcast at talkedaboutmarketing.com. And finally, the last word to Oscar Wilde. There's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about.